In this next module, I'm going to edit a student's essay from this class. Thanks to everyone who volunteered uh, on the pre-course survey to allow their work to be used for this kind of demonstration. Uh, this person responded to the prompt on essay assignment one to describe a hot paper in their field. What I want you to do now is to pause the video, read through the essay at least once or twice, uh, and then restart the video uh, and I'll walk you through it. I've also provided a text file if you'd rather read the essay there and if you have time you might even try editing it on your own. So this paper is on a biological topic. It describes, describes a key paper that found a new role for reactive oxygen species. The essay has a lot of strengths. It has some nice language. The author also did a great job of getting across the main point very quickly in the essay. So in this first paragraph, last sentence, in a landmark study published in the journal Plant Cell, Tanaka and colleagues recently uncovered an additional role for ROS as regulators of symbiosis. So that's a beautiful summary of exactly what this essay is about. And the reader is told very early on uh, what this paper is going to be about. The essay is also very well organized. It flows nicely and logically. We start with an overview, then we get some background, then the experiments, then the results, then the, the questions coming out of those results. So I'm not going to do any rearranging of sentences or paragraphs in this essay. I'm mostly going to focus on a little nip and tuck, uh, kind of a few spots where we can take out some unnecessary details and trim some extra words. So starting with the first paragraph here, first sentence, reactive oxygen species, ROS, are highly reactive chemicals often associated with escalating warfare between pathogens and their hosts. That's a really nice vivid sentence. It draws the reader in. I'm going to leave it exactly as it is. Most people today have probably heard about reactive oxygen species. They're widely talked about in the popular media. Most people know they're bad players. And that's a nice metaphor with the warfare here. I'm going to make one little change to the second sentence. So that sentence reads fine, except at the very end we get this to ward off microbial infections. It's just kind of, that's just kind of hanging there. It's just a, a little bit um, awkward. It's a, there's an easy fix though. All we have to do is add some dashes. We're going to set off the examples of the biological defenses with dashes here. So I can say, put those examples right in dashes uh, here and then we get at the end another dash. So for example, ROS are integral to biological defenses such as, example, example, uh, and then we have to change the two to a that, that ward off microbial infection. Setting it off in dashes just makes that whole thing easier to read, makes the connection between the beginning and the end of the sentence more clear. I'm going to also change to ward off microbial infections to uh, microbial invaders. It's just a slightly stronger word there and it goes along with this theme of warfare. One tiny change I'm going to make in the last sentence, in a uh, landmark study, uh, this was, the author uses the term recently. It's not exactly a recent study. If you look at the reference, it's a 2006 study, not totally recent, so I'm going to say in a landmark 2006 study. Let's just specify the date rather than saying recently. Moving on to the second paragraph, the second paragraph gives some background. The author goes into a little bit of technical detail about words to describe the fungus. In the context of this essay, I don't think that those are necessary because remember this essay is about the reactive oxygen species. It's not really about the fungus. So I'm going to delete some of the technical terms here. For example, in the first sentence, we get that the grass and the fungus, the fungus lives endophytically, i.e. inside the grass. Let's just say that the grass, uh, that the fungus lives inside the grass. We don't need that technical word there. Then we don't really need to hear about the mycelium of the fungus. Let's just say the fungus. Again, it's not important uh, to give the technical term in this particular context. So the fungus, and then we can get rid of this composed of cells called hyphae. Again, I don't think we need to know the technical term for the cells. It's not really important for this particular essay. So let's say, um, and then this sentence, the second sentence was a little bit long. And the most important point is really at the end. The fungus grows in perfect synchrony with the leaves of its plant host. So I'm actually going to rearrange this sentence just slightly by moving up that last thought to the beginning of this sentence. The fungus grows in perfect synchrony with uh, the plant. And I'm even going to delete the leaves. The leaves will come next with the plant. So we get right away the, the idea of this symbiosis. It grows in perfect synchrony with the plant. And then we can go right into this idea of colonizing. Colonizing 
all its leaves. We can say its rather than repeating of the plant, so colonizing all its leaves. Uh, but, and then the hyphae sprout only sparsely in tissue. We don't need all of that, I think. We could just go right into, but never breaching its cell walls or membranes. And we can end the sentence there. So it's just a little bit streamlined. The fungus grows in perfect synchrony with the plant, colonizing all its leaves, but never breaching its cell walls or membranes. And the next two sentences is the author uses the term harmonization. Uh, that's a nice word, but I'm, I don't think we need it twice. So I'm going to delete one of those instances of harmonization. And in this next sentence, I think we can just say uh, directly that exactly th what happens. So the grass directs resources to the fungus. The fungus produces a toxin that helps them both. I think we can be a little more direct. So I'm going to delete this exquisite harmonization of the fungus and the plant and just say uh, the plant. And then we get a, a couple of nouns that could be verbs here. So we get the, the, the plant ro um, growth directs resources to the production of fungal toxins, right? Growth and production, those could be verbs. So I think we can just say the plant, we could even just delete the plant growth. The plant directs resources to the fungus, uh, which produces Uh, we don't need fungal toxins, we could just say toxins, which produces toxins that protect the symbiosis from herbivores. The symbiosis, a lot of people may not have heard of symbiosis as a noun like that. I, I think it might be a little more clear to say that protect, the toxins that protect both species from herbivores. I also added in the sentence, uh, we were kind of talking about the role of the fungus in the previous sentence. For a little transition here, I added the plant in turn directs resources to the fungus, which produces toxins that protect both species from herbivores. Finally, in this last sentence, I'm just going to read it here, but how this harmonization is achieved and what its underlying mechanisms are have remained a mystery. Notice it's a little awkward to say are and then have. Notice also that we get how the harmonization is achieved and what its underlying mechanisms are. Those are kind of related concepts. It's a little bit repetitive. So I think we can cut one of those and just talk about the underlying mechanisms. So I'm going to say, uh, the other thing is I'm going to add a but until Tanaka here. Uh, because remember, this is uh, a 2006 paper. Up until Tanaka, it was a complete mystery. Tanaka actually maybe solved some of that mystery, so I think we have to acknowledge that here. So, but until Tanaka, uh, the mechanisms underlying this, how about we say exquisite harmonization we don't really need that word exquisite, but the author had used that term exquisite harmonization before. It just kind of shows the appreciation that the author has for this symbiosis. So I'm going to put it in there. Um, the mechanisms underlying this harmonization just have remained a mystery. And that will end that paragraph. So we get a nice summary of the background. And then we have a lovely transition here. We get, we're presented with a question, what are the mechanisms? And then the next paragraph starts to address this question. So the reader right, knows really uh, right away where, where we're going. So to address this question, Tanaka and co-workers, uh, now we get a whole bunch of details about random, how they generated random mutants of the fungus. I think the first sentence and second sentence of this paragraph can actually be combined into one. Uh, it's a little repetitive and we uh, probably can put it all into one sentence. So we get that they generated random uh, mutations in the first sentence and then we get how they did it in the second sentence. I think we can combine those by just saying that Tanaka and co-workers how about randomly randomly inserted pieces of DNA into the fungal genome. And then we can put in parentheses what the name of that method is. It's good to have that in there but it's probably extra information. They randomly inserted pieces of DNA into the fungal genome. And then why did they do that? In the hopes of disrupting. And then we get a gene resulting in observable growth changes in symbiosis. This is a little wordy. How about if we just say in, in hopes of, dis, of disrupting genes, probably more than one gene might be involved, genes involved or genes critical to, critical to the symbiosis.
And I think the reader can infer that if you disrupt those genes that are critical to the symbiosis, you would observe changes. So we don't need to spell that out so much for the reader. Then we get, they indeed found a mutant showing a highly unusual growth pattern. Nice use of the colon here to say exactly what that growth pattern is. Uh, I'm going to just make one tiny change. I just prefer indeed they found rather than they indeed found at personal preference. Both are fine. Uh, indeed they found a mutant, and I think I'm going to say a mutant strain. A mutant strain showing, uh, I think we could say with a highly, I slightly prefer with a highly unusual growth pattern here. And then we get this colon. Now, we get this unlike the synchronous growth of the wild type fungus. Well, we've already talked about the synchronous growth of the wild type fungus in the previous paragraph. I actually don't think we need to repeat that. I can. I think we can just go into right away what, what's different about the mutant. So we can just start with what's different about the mutant. Uh, we don't necessarily need that hyphae again, the technical term for the fungal cells. I think we can just say mutant fungal cells. It's not important uh, to get the technical term again in this context since the essay is mostly about reactive oxygen species so just mutant fungal cells and then we get a showed profuse and abundant pr proliferation so this was one of those instances where we've got a noun that could be a verb so showed proliferation we could just say proliferate and even simpler than the word prol proliferate how about if we just say grew so rather than show pr proliferation, how about proliferated or grew? Uh, and then we can say they grew profusely and abundantly, but actually profusely and abundantly are kind of the same thing. So I'm just going to say grew profusely throughout the grass. And then I am going to wrap this last sentence into the previous sentence. So they grew profusely throughout the grass, whereas, well, now let's say what happened to the plants, whereas the plants, or the inf we could say the whereas infected plants, infected plants and we don't have to say that they were infected by the mutant that's implied whereas infected plants and now we get another showed growth which could be just grew right it's a, another instance of a noun being turned a uh, verb being turned into a noun so let's turn it back to the verb so rather than showed poor growth how about grew poorly and often died all right so we've uh, trimmed that a little bit uh, go on to the next paragraph. Now, what's interesting is this author does a great job with the, uh, the logic and the flow. Again, they actually almost uh, give too many transitions that aren't really necessary. So notice in this next paragraph, it starts, this set the stage for the next step, finding the genetic changes that had caused these aberrations. I'm actually going to delete that entire sentence. The author uh, here has a tendency to want to start every paragraph with a little guidepost, a signpost for the reader to tell the reader exactly what's coming up in the paragraph. That's a good instinct, but in fact, the logical flow is so nice here that the reader doesn't need this kind of hand-holding. You can just go right into how the researchers figured out uh, what the genetic change was. The reader doesn't need that entire sentence. So trust your reader a little. You don't always need to handhold them. Sometimes explicit transitions like that are unnecessary if you've got good logic. So we're going to get rid of that. We're going to go right into using genetic tools. The researchers uh, honed in on the gene the DNA insertion had disrupted. Uh, surprisingly, only a single in integration event had occurred. Uh, notice the use of insertion and integration. Uh, probably that's a little repetitive. I think we can just combine this all into one using molecular tools. The researchers found that um, and in, I'm going to say um, an insertional event. I'm going to stick with insertion. An insert insertional event in a single gene. I think that's the idea here. An insertional event in a single gene had caused the aberrant growth or the abnormal growth. And since I deleted aberrant above in the uh, one of the sentences above, I'm going to say had caused the I like that word aberrant growth, and then we can just end that there. So they found that an insertional event in a single gene had caused the aberrant growth, and now I'm going to make a really small. Uh, sentence here, really short sentence. Sentence: The researchers named the gene NOXA. 
sometimes it's nice to just throw in a short sentence. Uh, it kind of adds to the sentence variety, the sentence structure variety here. It kind of punctuates this finding a little bit. Uh, so think about that occasionally throwing in a short sentence like that has a nice effect. Uh, now I have a really short paragraph here, so I'm going to fold this paragraph here in with the next paragraph. These can be brought together. So using molecular genetics tools, the researchers found that an insertional event in a single gene had caused the aberrant growth. The researchers named the gene Nox A. Uh, and now we get this, uh, again, the author wants to kind of tell the reader exactly what's happening next. To get an idea of what that protein does, the, the, the protein made by the gene does, the, the team did X, Y, and Z. I think we can actually jump right into what the team did and what they found all in one and get rid of this little signpost here. So I think we can just say, when they compared, we've already all just recently talked about the researchers, so we, the, the they is assumed to be the researchers. When they compared uh, its sequence, we've just said the gene, so it's okay to say its sequence. We'll know we're referring to the gene. When they compared its sequence with those of enzymes with known activities, and then let's just fold that right into the next sentence. What did, what did they find? They noticed that NOx A was very similar to uh, NADPH oxidases, enzymes that are often involved in generating ROS in cells. I think we can say just shorter than that, enzymes that generate ROS. And I don't think we need the in cells there that generate ROS. And then I'm actually going to end this new paragraph right there, set off another paragraph. And the reason I'm ending there is uh, to kind of punctuate this finding, this is where the researchers realized the link to ROS. So this is wrapping us around to the beginning of the, the essay, to the main point of the essay. So I'm going to punctuate that by ending the paragraph right there. And the next paragraph now starts with, um, indeed, the, the author here likes this um, transition word, indeed. We've already used it once, so I think we'll get rid of that. Uh, and actually, we can probably, it's saying, well, when they next did this, they observed this. We can probably just go right into what they observed. I'm going to say further testing revealed uh, that ROS accumulates uh, in plants infected uh, by the wild type fungus, uh, but not those infected by the Nox A disrupted mutant. I think we can say this shorter, but not those infected by the Nox A mutant. I think that would be sufficient there, Nox A mutants. Uh, this confirmed that, I'm actually going to change the confirmed that to uh, the researchers concluded that, or the scientists, just for variety, the scientists concluded that. The reason I'm not going to leave confirmed in here is because this is a really novel discovery, I think. And so confirmed implies like other people had suspected it before, um, but this I think is really novel, and so I, I'd rather say that they concluded that it's a new, totally new thing as opposed to a confirmation. And then that Nox A is involved in ROS production required for proper functioning of the symbiosis. I don't think we need all that. I think we can just say that ROS is a critical player in the symbiosis. That's the key finding. And we can end it there. Finally, in this last paragraph, we again kind of get a transition sentence. Well, this raises tantalizing questions. Instead of doing that, let's just go into right away, what is the open question? So how ROS enables symbiosis remains an open question. And notice I've put that in the present tense. Uh, I'm assuming that even today, seven years after Tanaka's study, that this is still an open question. We haven't solved it yet. And then we can talk about, uh, I might repeat Tanaka's team. I deleted here the, the reference to Tanaka again. So maybe I'll say Tanaka's team. Uh, suggest now this is a they probably suggested or speculated about this in the past when they published their paper so I think it should be a past tense they, they speculated back then when they published that paper that ROS could be involved I'm gonna change this to may be involved just because the next sentence has a may play a role I want those verbs to be parallel so may be involved in establishing physical connections between the cell walls of the plant and fungus Alternatively, ROS may play a role in symbiotic signaling. I'm going to change this colon to a semicolon. It's just, I think, slightly better to have a semicolon here because the second half of the sentence doesn't amplify the first half. It really is just a, a, a kind of a, another idea. Uh, I could go either way on that. Either a colon or a semicolon is probably fine. I slightly prefer a semicolon there. 
it's a new idea. So their short half-life predisposes them for cellular communication, perhaps facilitating an interspecies Morse code. That's kind of cool language. Uh, so their short life, but maybe we could say it a little shorter. Uh, how about their short life, their short half-life makes them perfect candidates. for an interspecies Morse code. And then we don't need that helps maintain the symbiosis. We don't need to repeat that because we already know that we're in a paragraph about how the symbiosis is maintained. So we can get rid of that extra completely. The reader doesn't need that. If so, identifying the plant sensor and signaling pathways, how about if we just say, if so, breaking the code, kind of playing on the Morse code idea from the previous sentence, if so, breaking the code, could provide deeper insights into how plants recognize and interact with beneficial symbionts and can distinguish them. Notice the lack of parallelism there. Recognize, interact, and distinguish. If we put can distinguish, it's not parallel, so I'm going to uh, eliminate that can. And then finally, I feel like we need to add a little tiny paragraph at the end here just to uh, provide a nice conclusion to wrap back to the beginning. Remember the focus of this paper is this new discovery that ROS aren't always bad players. So I feel like we need a little wrap up here. So I was gonna suggest to the, to the author something like Tanaka's paper fundamentally changed scientists view, uh, scientist views or view of ROS. Major shift here, uh, these chemicals, are not only weapons of biological warfare, I'm wrapping now, wrapping back now to the metaphor that was given at the beginning, uh, but also agents of peace and cooperation. Sometimes it's nice to, if you start with kind of a metaphor, a nice vivid idea to wrap back to that at the end of the piece. Uh, and then I'm gonna ask the author of this piece to maybe think about, are there any wider implications for biology of the fact that ROS are not always bad players. Are there any wider implications for biology even beyond symbiosis? It might be nice if there are to add that there.